Hi, I'm Martin Eve. Uh, I'm Professor of Literature, Technology and Publishing at Birkbeck, University of London, and I'm also the CEO of the Open Library of Humanities and one of its founders. The Open Library of Humanities is our attempt at implementing a publication platform for open access, high-quality, peer-reviewed work in the humanities disciplines. When you look at existing publication models for open access, they don't work very well in the humanities disciplines. So, for instance, the Public Library of Science is the biggest success for open access in the world. It's one of the largest journals in the world, PLOS One is their flagship publication. The challenge is that using the article processing charge model of charging, say, $2,000 per article doesn't work very well in disciplines where there isn't a huge amount of money going around. In fact, if I went to my executive dean and said, can I have $2,000 every time I published an article, I'd very quickly be laughed out of the office. We wanted to work out what we could do to mitigate this problem. And so instead of concentrating costs on single points, as article processing charges do, we came up with an economic model that distributes costs among a large number of libraries. So we have approximately 240 or so academic libraries around the world who pay less than that single article processing charge to us per year, but that allows us to publish all of our 27 journals completely open access without ever charging an author a fee up front. And I should probably stress that this comes with other benefits uh, unlike other open access publishers, we have no incentive to take material that doesn't pass rigorous quality control. It costs us every time we publish an article, as opposed to other providers who take revenue every time they publish an article. So we think there are many benefits to this model, uh, especially in the humanities. I think also what we've achieved with the platform is to show humanities researchers the benefits of open access for their scholarship and for reaching diverse publics with their work, but also showing them that there are ways that this can be done that are amenable to publication and economic cultures within the humanities. The majority of the world do not have access to scholarly or research material that's published. Often that research is funded uh, from taxpayer resources in the first place, so there are arguments you can make around the importance of uh, access to the people who pay for the research in the first place. I think for me though, working in a humanities discipline, uh, there's an especial importance to open access to scholarly research. And that is that we're studying people. We're studying human cultures, art forms, artifacts and histories. And what is the point of studying that if the very humans who are alive on the planet at this present moment have no access to that material? The policy landscape at the present time is changing incredibly rapidly, especially in Europe. Um, the recent announcement of Plan S mandates open access publishing by 2020 and uh, rules out what's called hybrid publishing, where you publish an open access article within a subscription venue. There's also talk of this plan expanding to the USA, and I know that delegates from Plan S have visited the USA. Uh, we don't know how widespread this will be in China and the Global South, but essentially this feels like a, a huge moment of change within the open access movement, which has existed for 20 years. Um, but to be on the cusp of what looks like more systemic adoption is quite an exciting aspect. So the policy comes from the European Commission uh, and it's adopted by uh, 13 national funders from 12 different countries across Europe. Uh, in the UK, for instance, UKRI is a signatory to the policy. Uh, UKRI includes Research England, which part owns the REF, along with devolved funding councils. So you see suddenly the scope of this policy and the fact that almost every researcher in the UK or funded in Europe uh, could be mandated to publish open access by 2020. When we think about publishing, we often tie it to project-specific grants. You get a grant to do research and you can build in publication costs for open access into that grant. In many ways, that doesn't make much sense. 
Um, it'd be like funding the electricity grid, a crucial component of contemporary society on a project basis, and when you stop funding it, the lights go out. So some people are now seeking to work out what it would look like to have a central service that provides an infrastructure for publishing that is independent of those project grants and is sustained uh, below the system of research funding. So initiatives like Open Air have set up an international network of institutional repositories. Um, there are subject repositories such as Archive that exist uh, at Cornell, for instance. Um, in the humanities, the Open Library of Humanities is a funding model, the organization I run, that allows us to continue our operation rather than charging per article. And I think in many ways, when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about an economic shift from thinking about unit costs of outputs think about ongoing organisational costs and ensuring that what we need to publish exists below that substrate of how much it costs to publish a journal, how much a book costs independently. Uh. Libraries are really at the coal face of change in the 21st century. Um, they're attacked from all sides. Um, they're attacked for not providing enough physical space and old school books, while at the same time uh, other facts, factions attack libraries saying, You're, what's your point in the digital world? But essentially libraries are now the mediators of information overload. Uh, they're the curators who can help us to navigate an increasingly complex digital space where there's far too much to read all the time. Understanding this shift that's often been billed as moving from collecting to connecting is absolutely essential for librarians. So librarians are not really the custodians of locked gates anymore. They don't hold the keys to access necessarily in an open access world. But they are a profession who can continue to help researchers to navigate an increasingly complex, overloaded and diverse information ecology. The number one thing that OLH does for librarians who wish to advocate for open access is to show humanities researchers that there is a way that this is possible. We've lowered the barriers to participation to be equal to conventional subscription publishing for humanities researchers. If you can pass peer review, we will publish your work, rather than if you can pass peer review and get hold of loads of money, we'll publish your work. And that seems to be one of the most important things we can do. We're building an enormous repository of open access material in the humanities, showing its benefits to researchers who then go to their libraries with support for open access in mind rather than feeling it's an antagonistic system that sits opposite them. So Peter Subers described these disciplines as being a dry climate, dry funding climate for open access. We're showing that it doesn't have to be and that there are ways this can be achieved um, and that helps all librarians who are advocating for open access around the world in these disciplinary spaces.